When I come into his presence, I humble myself, lift up both my hands, and I begin to worship him. Love him. When I come into his presence, I humble myself, lift up both my hands, and I begin to worship Him. I worship Him for. my hands and I begin to worship him. I worship him when I come into his presence I humble myself Lift up both my hands and I begin to worship Him. I worship Him for.
devotional period and the uh, ministry of song. Uh, thank God for all of you who have come out and for our last night of our vacation Bible school, but, but not our last time, but just our last night. So if you would bow your heads with me for a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for just being God. No one else but you. And Father, we just ask that at this moment it would not be our way but yours and not our will but yours. We ask that you would convey unto us the things of your word in scripture that you would have us to understand and then compel and convict us by your word that we would not just be hearers, but doers as well. And we give all the praise and the glory to thee. In the name of Christ, we ask it, and for his sake, amen. This evening, we would like to focus our attention to the Word of God out of the third chapter of the book of Matthew. And we will begin at the 13th verse. I'll be reading from the King James translation. Matthew, the third chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. You may be seated. Just for a moment. We just want to look at the benefit of just saying yes. Jesus and John are meeting in the river of Jordan. And it's 
actually the first time that they have physically seen each other. The first time that they met, they once again were in water, but they were in the water of their mother's womb. But they leap for joy when they recognize one another. And now, some 30 years later, we want to talk about that 30 because uh, the scripture then actually say to us that Christ was 30 at his baptism, but it is customary in our faith, but it is not without cause, so we will look at that later. But they meet at the Jordan River, and again, for the first time, water is the occasion that brings them together. And it is in the process of fulfilling the will of God. John recognizing who Christ is and being overwhelmed said that are you coming to me for me to baptize you? When actually I am in need of being baptized by you. But because of obedience, Christ asked John to suffer it, to bear it, to receive the inevitable and the unavoidable that the will of God would be fulfilled. And sometimes I wondered myself that since Christ was holy, is holy, that why was it necessary for him to go through the same customs and the same teaching that is required of us. Since the teaching is about him. But I recognize that his purpose was to demonstrate for us what is required of us as children of God in our humanness. And so in accordance with the spirit of God, which became flesh, the order of God did not change. So he asked John to bear it and to suffer it so that all righteousness would be fulfilled. And the scripture tells us that John bared it or John suffered it. Now, I want to backtrack just a minute to just look at some of the similarities of how God moves. The scripture in the second chapter of Matthew, I believe it starts at the uh, 13th verse. And uh, 
it talks about how Christ, I mean, how God told Joseph in a dream to take the child and Mary and to flee and go into Egypt because Herod had sent a decree to kill all the male children from two years old and down. And isn't it something how when God is moving and offering for us what is good for us, that there's an element among us that chooses to kill what God has for us. I thought it was worthy to mention that God bought, brought the deliverer out of Egypt and brought him in in a basket in the water. And his name was Moses. And then he brought Moses out of Egypt to deliver the Hebrews from their oppression. And then he tells Joseph to send his son into Egypt so that the scripture would be fulfilled where he said, and out of Egypt, I will bring my son. So once he brought the deliverer for the Hebrew nation out of Egypt, and the second time he brought the savior for the world out of Egypt. I want us to just reflect just a minute some of the oldest shrines in the world and the oldest writings in the world to the origin of our faith are found in Ethiopia and Egypt. I'm going to say that again. Many of them were stolen and taken out of Ethiopia and Egypt, and now they reside in museums around the world in showcases. But the origin of them, the oldest shrines and relics, were taken out of Ethiopia and Egypt. I know this is not uh, Black History Month, so forgive me, but the history speaks for itself. Now, I want to look at the trail path here. We know that during the Passover, and this is out of uh, Luke, the second chapter, and I believe it's the 41st, uh, I think it starts at the 41st verse, but it speaks of Jesus, and as we're saying yes, we need to look at the preparation that prepares us to say yes. But it talks about how Jesus and his parents took him to Jerusalem for the Passover. And, and once the Passover days were complete, that as they were leaving, their parents were in the crowd and it was assumed that Jesus was also 
in the midst of the crowd with the family and his kinfolk. And they were on a day's journey before they recognized that Jesus was missing. And so then they went in search for Christ for three days before they found him. And when they found him, he was where? He was in the temple. And the scripture says that he was listening or that he was hearing and asking questions. He was hearing and asking questions. And so they were astonished when they heard what he was saying because they were astonished at his understanding. And they were astonished at how he was asking questions. And then the scripture tells us that his parents said, you know, you've had us all worried about you and we were looking for you and we were wondering where were you at and why did you do that to us? And his response was, well, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Now that's what the scripture says to us. I want us to look at that in another light. You remember when we were kids how we could go out from the house and we could play like from sun up to sundown and all we had to tell our parents was is that I'm going to the boys club or I'm going to the park or I'm going over my cousin's house or what have you and it just it was like understood and there was no fear. You know, there was no worry as to what's gonna happen to them. You know, can you imagine us doing that now? You know, saying, uh, hey, I'm gonna go to the boys club. Uh, well, wait a minute, uh, who are you gonna be up there with? Uh, now that's some parents. And then, you know, who you going to be with? Well, let me, uh, uh, you got your phone with you? Uh, make sure the ringer is on. Uh, uh, I'm going to call, I'm going to come up there. Uh, take, take, or he, take him on up here with you. I, I want a chaperone with you and all. But we could go and just run and have free will and there was no worry and everything was safe. This was kind of like, the understanding how Jesus, it was assumed that he was in the crowd because even though he was in the crowd, the crowd, it was safe to be in the crowd. Now it ain't safe to be in the crowd, but it was safe to be in the crowd then. And as long as you were in the crowd, parents and elders didn't have any worry because they wasn't worried about boom, boom, and bam, bam in the crowd. It was safe. And it was like, well, it don't matter because we all just left an assembly and we are all on one accord. And as long as he is in the crowd, everything is good. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that you know, just happened in the past. It was in our past just a few years ago. But look at how it's transitioned now. And then, listen at this here. He's the son of God, yet he's sitting and he's listening. Hearing and asking questions. I don't know, I don't know what this is that, that's going on now. I mean, I've heard a lot of theories and stuff about it, but I'm in class and I ask my students, and, and don't nobody, don't bring this up at the end when they have the Q&A session. I'm just saying this as a metaphor. But I'm in there and I ask my students, I said, does anybody have any questions? 
and I can hear a pin drop on carpet. And, you know, and I have to probe to get questions to come out. You know, but here Christ is with the answers to all the questions. But he's sitting here listening, hearing what's said, and asking questions. You know, how do we learn if we don't ask questions? Now remember, don't bring that up at the end in the Q&A session. <laughs> I'm not Christ. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. <laughs> but I just bring this up. Now, now I, wanna, I want us to uh, look at this in the light of humor as well. Now, the scripture tells us that, you know, Joseph and Mary, you know, they were looking around. Now, here's my take on it. Joseph, where is Jesus? He's around here with the other boys. He's somewhere in the crowd. Well, I'm just asking, honey, because, you know, we got to keep up with the kids. What, what, he's, he's here. I, well, I'm saying because, you know, the boys are supposed to be with the men, and I'm just saying, where is, jo where, where is Jesus at? Don't worry about it, honey. He's, he's right here. You know, he's with us. And then a day later, Joseph, where is Jesus? <laughs> honey, he, he's, not, he's not with you? I, th I thought you had him. The last time I spoke to you, <laughs> you said <laughs> that you had seen him with other boys. <laughs> well, Oh my God, you men, I'm telling you, you are, what simple things, and you are, when, where are we going to look for him at? Well, let's go check with the kinfolk, let's, uh, well, I don't know which house do you think he went to, well, honey, well, now this ain't all my fault, now you was there too, come on, Mary, oh, let's just go. Well, I don't know where you think. Well, you know whatever I say ain't going to be right, so where you think we should go first? Let's go by the temple. We go into the temple, and on the way there, Joseph is talking, and he's like, you know, that boy has just become in trouble. And, you know, every time you say something to him, he's got one of these, you know, proverbial phrases that he gives. You know, if he, he got one more time, to come up with one of them proverbial phrases. And I'm telling you, one more time. And then when we find him and we question him, and he says, didn't you know that I was going to see? That's what I'm talking about. That right there. Right there. Those proverbial phrases. And then what the scripture said at the end, you know, <laughs> they're like, well, they left, but they didn't understand. Now, can't you hear Mary and Joseph on the way going back? Did you understand what he just said? I didn't understand. Well, you act like you understood. Well, I thought you, I, we, I was going to ask you about it. So I'm just saying, you know, it's good for us to see Scripture. But, you know, put yourself in that spot. Because if we really can't see ourselves in that spot, how are we going to apply it? Now, here's another thing I want us to look at. There is something so awesome about seeing the Spirit of God in action, absent of us. John has been out here on the beaten path, preaching and teaching and telling folks, get your act together. Make straight your path, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's developed a following. And every time he came out in the wilderness, people were there listening to him because they knew that the Messiah was due. And they were wondering if he would appear 
when John was preaching, John had a gathering. People were waiting on him. And yet, while he had this following and had this gathering, and people were looking forward to seeing his name, if we put it in today's term, they were looking on the marquee for neon lights saying John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. And yet, when Christ appears, he lost all of that fame like that. Because it wasn't John. It wasn't his will. He wasn't acting out of his flesh. He was submitting to the spirit. And look how smooth things moved when he submitted to the spirit. He was humbled even by it. He wanted to forsake his responsibility in performing the baptism so that the anointing would fall on him also. Not that he didn't recognize that it was already on him because he wanted to have Christ to baptize him. But he was fulfilled in it when he did what the Spirit said. A lot of times God puts us in places and he prepared it before we even got there. And he brought an announcer to proclaim your interests. The same way he did for Christ. He could have just come out and said, uh, John, have a seat. I'm, I'm who he's talking about. I'm the son of God. But why is it necessary to fulfill all righteousness because human nature has flaws and there must be order established to control the flaws and eliminate our fallacies. So although Christ could have said, John, have a seat. It's my turn. This is my day. He even said, I don't need the baptism, but I will submit to it because it is the will of my Father who sent me. And even though I am the Father in flesh, I will still fulfill the will of my Father. We are not above what God requires of us. Don't try to kick the door in and push your way. Allow him to open it. Allow him to announce your entry. Because when he opens the door, he's already prepared the entry. Too many times we try to push ourselves where we don't belong. Trying to get there too early, not prepared for it. Allow him to smooth those bumps out of the road. And don't think just because he prepared the entry that there aren't some lumps and some hills and some valleys still on that road. Look for him, but recognize you've been empowered to smooth those high places out, to raise those low places up to take those bumps out of the road. You wouldn't even know we had that kind of power unless he put them there. But he didn't put them there to be obstacles in our way. He put them there for us to recognize that through Christ, we can do all things. I'm want to close on this point. 
I said earlier that it is a custom, it is assumed in our spirit or in our faith, in our faith, that Christ was 30. But if you look in Matthew at the baptism scene, if you look in John at the baptism scene, if you look in Luke at the baptism scene, if you look in Mark, none of them say he was 30 years old. But look again at what he meant when it said to fulfill all righteousness. Back in Numbers, in the fourth chapter of Numbers and the third verse, in the fourth chapter of Numbers and the 23rd verse, in the fourth chapter of Numbers and the 30th verse, 4, 23, and 30, and further on in the book of Numbers, the fourth chapter, you will find that Moses had received a command from God to tell Aaron to assemble different ones who were related to Levi. They were sons of the Levites. And what he told them was to prepare them for their work in the tabernacle. They were becoming priests. And he said from the age 30 to 50, at the age of 30, some of us trying to do it at 10. At the age of 30, because there is an order that God has, and he wants his priests prepared. Now, what does that mean? I can't be prepared at 30? No, I didn't say that, because he also called some of the major prophets at early ages. What I'm saying is, there are exceptions, but there is still a rule. And to fulfill all righteousness, Christ is assumed that he came into the baptism at the age of 30, because that was when he began his ministry. And that was when the other priests were prepared for the work of the tabernacle. There is an order that is decreed for us, and the sooner we get on to it, our blessings are going to be flowing over the cup, the saucer, down on the floor, running out of the door. Now, after all these things were fulfilled, Then, heaven opened up. And here in Christ's ministry, here is the presence of the Trinity. The heavens opened up. The voice of the Lord spoke. And the Spirit descended as though it was the dove anointing the Son of God. And all three were present. And in concert, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God bless you and thank you. And I hope that we've shared something that will help all of us and strengthen all of us to be about the work of the Lord. God bless you.